Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Mary Cosby, and I'm a senior consultant for IBIS. This webinar is going to cover um, scheduling um, primarily on the production side. And we will talk, um, most of it is going to be around the settings and the tools in AX um, to help us do the scheduling, and then we'll run a, a scheduling exercise you can see what it looks like. Um, okay, and I am going to go ahead and mute the call, um, and then we'll take questions at the end. All right? Muted. Okay, so scheduling in AX 2012 is the topic of our, com of our webinar today. And basically, just clearing up what scheduling is, um, it involves coordinating elements of the production process to most um, optimize delivery dates. So what we're talking about here is you have a demand in the system. Um, I like to use the supply-demand analogy a lot. You basically have a demand in the system that can come from a sales order, uh, it can come from forecasting, it can come from min-max levels. Um, but that creates a demand in the system. Now, based on the way you have the item set up, you can actually have different resources associated with the, the item that needs to be manufactured. So then those resources can be scheduled, and based on their capacity, you can then end up with a delivery date for the production order and ultimately for filling the demand requirement. So what does, what does scheduling include? It includes scheduling methods, capacity planning, master planning and planned production orders, unit charts, which as we get into this, there's two forms of scheduling. There's operational scheduling and there's job scheduling. Um, the Gantt chart only works from the job scheduling um, perspective. And then scheduling with subcontractors. Now, before you can get started with scheduling, obviously with any AX functionality, uh, there are setups and parameters that need to be completed before the scheduling engine actually knows how to perform. So, what we'll take a look at real quick are just the parameters and the setup. When you're talking about scheduling resources, the system needs to know, the scheduling engine needs to know what calendar am I working on. Um, what working times am I working on? For instance, I might have a business that's running three shifts, and I have resources that work specific shifts, or machines that may be down specific shifts for maintenance or whatever. Um, so this gives the scheduling engine the ability to know what times are available for scheduling its resources. The third thing that you need to take a look at are your actual resource and resource groups. Um, if you're familiar with AX prior to 2012, um, the AX used what were called work center groups and work centers. They are now gone and they use resource and resource groups in AX 2012. And we'll, um, we'll look at that briefly as well. So to get set up, within the production parameters, I've just kind of um, noted a couple of parameter settings that I think are, are important. They're all important, but uh, just to make sure that, that you're understanding what you're looking at when you're looking at these parameters. On capacity planning, under the production parameters, there is the ability to, to capacity plan against the planned order as well as against a project. So what this basically means is that when I create the planned order, when master planning runs and a planned order is created, it will look at the capacity for that potential plan for that planned order against your um, what your available resources are. From a project standpoint, it looks at the forecast of the particular project or subproject. It will look at the resource that's been associated with that 
And it will, again, drive some capacity planning from the project forecast side. The report is finished delete capacity reservations. It's kind of self-explanatory. When you do the report is finished transaction on a production order, it will go ahead and delete any reservations, capacity reservations, um, that are still pending for whatever reason on that production order. The scheduling method determines the default scheduling method for production. Um, this is basically, where, and we'll go into this in a couple minutes, um, there's two types of scheduling methods. There's operation scheduling and there's job scheduling. So this just basically sets the default for the system. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the switches on the production parameters, but obviously it's going to be important that those are reviewed and set based on the requirements for the for the uh, particular application that you're that you're setting this up for. Now I talked about the three things: the parameters, the resource group, and the calendar. This is basically looking at. Um, the resource and resource group allow you to use your organization's resources um, efficiently and effectively when they're needed. There are two types of resources. There's scheduling resources, which is used on the production side. And you can also do some assigning resources on the project side for using activities. Um, again, this is primarily going to be on the production side. But I will show you at the end how you can actually take it from the forecast um, and, and schedule a resource based on the forecast of against a project or a sub-project. In this case, the forecast is, is actually the budget for the particular project. Okay, when we talk about resource and resource groups, in AX 2012, these are the different types of resources that there are. Um, vendor is pretty self-explanatory. Human resources, that's your actual worker slash labor force. Um, machine, you can actually associate a machine to a resource. Um, and this is particularly important. important, I think, if you've got a bottleneck um, for a machine. Um, so you can assign the machines as well. If you've got a particular tool that you want to track from a resource uh, availability standpoint, um, equipment and location. Location is a new one, I believe, in AX 2012. And that's basically, uh, you know, it's basically a, a physical location on a production floor that um, you may need to reserve that space for a particular, um, you know, process that, that, that the production is going through. And it you know it's got processes going in and out of it, and you want that location to be able to be reserved for um, a particular job that's coming through the line. Now, just just to remind you that the work centers and work center groups in 2009 are replaced with resource and resource groups in, in 2012. Um, a couple of nice features that that brought about was that the resources can, may, or may not have to be um, associated with the work center group. Prior to 2012, it had to be associated with the group, um, which meant that the resources were not necessarily um, flexible to be able to be used. In 2012, you can use a resource, or you can use a resource group. Now, if you use a resource group, what the scheduling engine will do is it will look at all of the resources within that group and it will schedule based on availability of a resource within the group. So it gives you a broader, uh, broader spectrum, um, broader availability of resources that the scheduling engine will then go ahead and use um, resources within that group to schedule your particular job or operation. Um, because they're not associated, because they don't have to be associated with work in a group, the work in the resources can be moved from one group to another. So if you've got a resource that, um, 
temporarily is moving to another, it needs to be included in another group, um, then you can go ahead and move them to that group for whatever the period of time is. Now, one of the other things that 2012 has brought into the resource and resource groups is the ability to associate skills and capabilities and competency um, to resources. So let's say you've got a, um, an, an assembly worker, um, the particular operation needs the machine to be moved from point A to point B. Um, it requires a um, certified forklift operator to do that particular function. Um, this is kind of a simple example, but within the skills, and competencies and capabilities, you can flag that that particular person has that skill, um, has that certification, so that when you go to schedule an operation, in this example, it will pull the resource with that particular um, capability. So it allows you to go down to certifications and skills, things that people are specifically trained to do, um, to be able to schedule your resources um, better um, and more clearly as far as what their capabilities are. Uh, working uh, calendars and working times, this really didn't change much from 2009. Um, you basically got the calendars, the period types, the templates, and the working time templates. Um, what I'm going to do is just um, just real quick, I want to show you where this information is located. It is currently, it is now in the Organization um, Administration Module, NAS. These, uh, the resources tab here on the common, these are where my resources are. You can create your resources here, um, as in prior versions. You can put efficiency percentages on these as they apply to the specific resource. Um, what this basically does is if the person's got, and I've got an example on a later slide, if you've got a resource that's scheduled for 14 hours, you typically are not going to get 100% efficiency out of any employee. If you did, the scheduling engine would schedule the 14 hours. If I change that to say 80%, and if the um, particular route is scheduled for 14 hours, the, the operation, the system, the scheduling engine will say, well, this resource is only at an 80% efficiency percentage. Therefore, it's going to take this resource 17.5 hours to complete 14 hours. So the scheduling engine will then schedule based on the 17.4 hours or 5 um, versus the 14 that was actually part of the, um, the run time on the operation on the route. So it gives you the ability to um, recognize that, it's, that nobody works really solid 8 hours a day. Um, and it, so it gives you the ability to really to truly indicate how long something's going to take based on what a particular efficiency might be. You might have a machine that goes down two hours a day because it has some sort of a maintenance. This would be an area where you could say, okay, I know I need to schedule that machine, but I know I only get six hours a day instead of eight, so you can, you can adjust the efficiency percentage um, to reflect that um, time down in your, um, when the scheduling engine um, goes through. Now I talked about you can do capabilities against the particular resource. And again, this way when you're actually setting up a, a, set, a requirement for a resource and you want the scheduling engine to go find the best resource that's available, you could do it based on a capability as well. Now from my resource form, I can look at um, the particular capacity load for this particular um, resource, and you can see that he's actually reserved currently um, for eight hours each day. And if you look at the reference, this will actually tell you what type of job is scheduled. In this case, it's an operations scheduled job. 
and it's going to tell you what project is actually being, in this case, it's, um, it's a project that's being scheduled for this particular resource based on a forecast. So it's due in eight hours. <clears throat> now, if we look at the, the calendar real quick, which is in the same area, so what you have are your calendar set up, um, and it just depends on, you know, what your requirements are from your production or your project management. Um, because the default calendar is also associated with the project um, when they're created. But basically what this does, if you look at the standard calendar here, and you look at the working time, it's basically telling you that this, this particular base calendar is a 24-hour calendar, and it's at 100%. You typically will have something that looks more like this, where you have a start time of 8 to 12 and 1 to 5. So this means I have four hours in the morning, a break for lunch, and then four hours in the afternoon at 100% efficiency. So using this calendar, this is again where you can put an efficiency on the calendar versus the resource. And it will schedule, and that's why when you saw that project, and you saw in the reference it was four hours and four hours, it's because of the working times. It's, it's split into four, um, two different segments on that particular day. Um, on the calendar, when you set these up, you'll need to make sure that you mark anything closed, that where that day should not be scheduled for any kind of capacity. Um, one other thing on this is the working time template. It's important to set this up because when you create a new um, a new calendar, you use the template to generate the, the working time at the bottom of the form that you saw. So if you go into Monday, you'll see that this particular working time template, which is a standard work day, is from 8 to 12 and 1 to 5. So if you create a new calendar, you can apply that template to it and not have to go into every single day and create what those working times are per day. So this then is just, again, it's just a screenshot of the capacity load. Um, in this particular case, this particular capacity resource based on this plan um, is, is basically available. His capacity is 24 hours a day. He has 24 hours remaining that can be booked. So that's kind of the basics behind what needs to be set up in order for the scheduling engine to run. Um, obviously, you also have to have um, materials. Um, you need to have a, an item or in 2012 a product set up. There's a bill of material um, and a route associated with that bill of material so that the system knows when it creates a planned order exactly what it's planning against. So if we just jump over here real quick, I do have an item set up. It's a very basic, simple item. It's now located in the product information management. It is a released product. If you're not familiar with it in 2012, you can have um, products that are there for use across multiple companies. But until they're actually released to a company, they're not available for use by that company. So it gives you some ability to create, I create items slash products. Possibly have them go through a workflow review process prior to actually releasing them to be used by a particular company. Also in 2012, in case you again aren't familiar, there's a when the form opens up, it, it opens up into this item number search. So I can just do a simple search and say look for everything that starts with MC. And you don't have to do the um, the asterisk or anything here, you just type what you're looking for, and obviously it's pulling anything where it finds MC in the item number. And you can also do a drop down and change what search you're doing on. But in this particular case, we're going to look at this particular particular item. And if we're going to engineering and we're going to the door material line, you'll see that I actually have an item on there. Um, nothing fancy, just uh, I think it's grill screws or something like that. But when I go into the route, I actually have just a simple route. I have it created here of the operation that I'm using, um, how much run time it's going to take, what the process quantity is. And then on the resource requirements, you'll see that I'm using resource 00101. 
So now it knows when I'm scheduling what resource I want to use to schedule against this particular um, operation in the route. So that's the basic. Um, obviously, if I have a production order and I want to schedule resources against that production order, then the route should be important to do that. If you're not scheduling, if you're not trying to schedule your resources and look at your capacity, um, you know, you could have just a simple production order with no route. Um, you know, it just depends on the level of detail that you want to track and how much, you know, how what the requirement is for knowing where things are in the system. <clears throat> so the actual the role of the scheduling system is to plan the actual production process in such a way that each each operation in the production round is assigned a starting and ending date and time, and that the materials needed for production are available when the operation starts. <clears throat> so some of the concepts that you need to consider, um, or you need to have an understanding of in 2012 when you're doing this, include scheduling levels. There are two scheduling levels. One is operation scheduling, one is job scheduling. We'll get into that. We'll get into all of these in a little bit more detail. Um, the scheduling direction, uh, whether it's finite or infinite capacity, um, what your efficiencies are, which we've already talked about that as far as your efficiency percentages, um, and whether or not finite materials are also uh, should also be considered when the scheduling engine runs. So first on the scheduling levels, there's two types again. There's operations scheduling and there's job scheduling. Um, operations scheduling is probably the most widely used. Um, it gives you a long-term kind of a rough cut capacity plan, um, and it's just based on dates. If you get into job scheduling, that's more used for short term, and it does calculate both start and end time when the capacity, when the resource is reserved from for a capacity standpoint. So the job scheduling obviously is much more detailed uh, me, than the operation scheduling is. And if you remember from the parameters, you can um, establish and set what the default scheduling level should be. Now from a scheduling direction standpoint, there's forward scheduling and there's backward scheduling. These are just a couple of simple illustrations that kind of show you can forward schedule it, which is the push method, uh, which basically says I want to schedule it forward. And you determine when you do the scheduling um, what that scheduling forward is based on. Typically, if you leave it blank, it's going to do whatever, it's going to be based on whatever the current date is. But you can, you can assign a scheduling date to the forward scheduling. You can tell it to look at the, um, the delivery date. In other words, you look at the, the date required on the production order and let it schedule based on that delivery date. The back of scheduling is the same concept. Um, it's, the pull, it's what they call the pull method. And that basically is doing the reverse of that. So if I know that my delivery date is February 10th, um, and it's going to take two hours, and I backwards schedule it from my my requirement date, my delivery date, of the production order. Then it's going to back it up and say, well, then you need to start probably um, if it's eight hours a day, then you would need to if my capacity is available or whatever it finds available to assign. It's obviously going to tell me to, to do the production on the eighth and ninth to make it available for the tenth. And that's a simple example, um, you know, based on whether or not there's any other. Um, factors in the system that might add some additional processing time. But that's basically what these, these illustrations are showing. And it's, you know, again, the backward scheduling, you can, there's a very backward scheduling options that you can use, and you'll see those uh, again in a few minutes. And actually, here it is. So from the scheduling directions, you can see that I can do forward from today. So it's going to look at whatever the system date is. I can look at forward from the plan start. So when I do my plan production orders, I can actually say, well, I'm going to plan on starting this here. And then you can run scheduling. You can run the scheduling in engine based on that planned start date. And then that would then help determine what my resources are available based on that particular start date. 
Um, and then you go obviously forward from tomorrow or forward from the previous job. And the backwards are per pretty much the same thing. You got backwards from delivery date, um, planned in, the scheduling date. If you select the scheduling direction based on the plan on the scheduling date, then it is going to be based on whatever date you plug into this particular scheduling date field. This is where it's going to pull it from. If you've got planned messages out there, so when you run master planning, which is an integral part of doing the production scheduling, <clears throat> um, it will create action date or futures date. Um, let's say that you, you know, the action, the action date could say, well, you need to postpone this for two weeks, and then you wanted to plan based on that particular action message, then you would do a backwards scheduling from the action date. And the same thing with the futures. If it tells you to bump it out or pull it back, change the quantities, whatever, um, it will base it based on the date on the master plan, either action or future messages. Now, one of the other things that we talked about that will affect your scheduling and your availability of resources. Remember, when it's scheduling, it's looking at the available resources. And it's saying, based on what you have available from a capacity standpoint to do a particular production order, let's say, it's going to say, well, based on your available resources, then your delivery on this production order can be X. Now, when you're scheduling the resources to determine what that delivery date can be for that particular production order, which by the way, will flow over into the what's driving the demand for the production order. So that was, in, in my instance, in my example, it would be a sales order. I have a sales order open for that MC bomb item, and it's driving the demand um, for this production order, which would then be the supply. So when I look at that particular production order and I'm trying to plan it and I'm looking at my resources, I can either do it with finite or infinite capacity. Um, Sunlight is typically used if you have a bottleneck area that has absolutely restricted, cannot add any more capacity to it in order to be able to schedule that production. Infinite capacity gives, basically gives you the ability that you could add more resources if you needed to um, to fill whatever the demand is that's being driven by the production order. So. Bottom line, if you look at the, the little graph here, it'll actually show that you have reserve capacity. And if I want to schedule a new job and my resource is based and it's based on infinite capacity, then it'll just load it on top of what's already there. Um, you can look at it and you can reschedule and plan things. Um, but it, it gives you the ability to say, okay, I know I, I know I can pull some more resources in for that particular operation. Let me do that and schedule that particular resource. Um, versus on the finite capacity, it, you can't do that. If if it's finite capacity, it's basically saying I have limited capacity for this particular resource. I can't add any more to it, um, and therefore it doesn't just like lay it on top of what's already there, whether there's available time or not. With finite capacity, the time has to be there. It has to be available to reserve against that particular capacity. And I made a note because on when you're scheduling, there is a, a switch here for a bottleneck resource. And this is where you can define on the particular resource if it should be considered as finite capacity. And if you click that on, obviously it's going to require that this, uh, the um, capacity be available. But if you click the bottleneck resource, it will give you a message and say, if you're selecting this, then it has to be finite capacity. So it's just an error, a uh, little message that you'll get. Go back and flip the finite capacity on, and then you can identify it as a bottleneck resource. Um, a couple of things when you're doing finite capacity from a consideration standpoint. Um, if, this, if it's defined as finite on the resource or the resource group, it will overrun the scheduling. So you'll see that when you do the scheduling, there is an option there to do finite capacity. Um, 
and if it's set, depending on how it's set on the resource or resource group, just keep in mind that it can override the scheduling. So if it's blank on the scheduling, finite on the resource or the resource group, it will finite capacity schedule that particular uh, resource. Um, and if it's not defined, then whatever scheduling setup is used will be defined. And again, just a note on the bottleneck resources, um, they are typically set up with finite capacity um, while the other ones are left available. So you can have a mix, the, the point is you can have a, a mix and match um, where you basically have some resources that have been finite capacity and some resources that are finite. And then that, that's all driven then by the scheduling engine to determine what the, the uh, availability is of the resource. I mentioned efficiency percentage, um, and again, it just reduces or increases the time reserved for a resource or resource group. I don't know that I've ever seen one increase. Um, uh, there, there's probably an example or two out there, I, I don't know. But on the example here, this is the one I mentioned earlier, I have 14 hours required for that resource. Um, that particular resource has an 80% efficiency. So when I run, when I schedule that particular resource, it's going to actually schedule the 17.5 hours versus the 14. So it's just good to keep that in mind in the back of your head if you're doing some scheduling and you're wondering why a particular um, resource is being scheduled for more than what you actually have on the, um, on the route then that's probably why. It's probably because there's an efficiency percentage set up or it's been scheduled with one where it's actually causing um, an increase in the number of hours that are actually going to be needed to perform the particular operation. You can also do finite material scheduling. So if you, if you think back, uh, massive planning is pretty much the engine for all of the planning, including the capacity. Um, it will, well, you have operation scheduling, job scheduling, but the, the master planning will create the plan production orders, which will then allow you to uh, schedule your resources, schedule your capacity. Um, but it can also schedule your, it, uh, it also creates your plan messages for materials that you may or may not need. And if it's finite materials, then these are basically critical materials that are needed and required for that particular production or that particular route step, and it cannot be started, it cannot be um, moved on if you have finite material that's required for that particular order. So what it will do, that when you create the production order, the first time it's scheduled, it will run an explosion on the production bill of material, and it will reserve those particular materials that are in stock for that particular production order. If the material is not in stock, master planning will create a planned order for the material. And then typically based on the delivery date of the, of the purchase order, let's say, that will then drive the schedule for the actual production order and trying to achieve what that delivery date is. If my material is not finite, it just assumes that I'm going to have what I need when I need it. Um, and not, not require a reservation against that material for that production order or that operation route, then it will, um, you know, it'll, it'll, it'll lock, it'll, it'll stop you from being able, well, it's going to schedule the delivery date of the production order based on when that finite material is actually reserved versus if it's not finite material, again, it, it assumes that you have it in stock. If there's any changes to the bill of material, um, the next scheduling will run an explosion of that bill, that production bomb. And again, if it's finite material, it's going to require that material to be reserved in order to um, schedule the particular job. And just a note that I put in here, when optimizing on both capacity and material, it, production is calculated to meet both of the restrictions. So it's going to look at your capacity resource and your material resources if it's finite when it's scheduling your particular production order to come up with what your potential delivery date can be. So 
So from operation scheduling, um, this is actually done. It can be it can be done as an AX in you know. Um, AX typically has multiple places where you can perform multiple functions. In the periodic, you can actually set up operation scheduling and or job scheduling. And then you can set these up in a batch so they typically will run, you know, um, if you run a master planning to create your plan production orders and your plan purchase orders, that's typically done as a batch. It's done at night. Although you can set specific criteria where you might want to run um, a particular um, buyer group or coverage group during the day because you know that there's things being made. But the operations and job scheduling can be done the same way, where you just set it up as a batch, and obviously you would set up whatever your, your uh, reoccurrence is on that particular batch. But this is where when you're running this particular operation scheduling, you can schedule references, you can synchronize references, and this is where your limitations, where you can say, I want to use finite capacity, finite material, um, keep the production unit, keep the warehouse from the resource, um, put in your scheduling direction, your scheduling date. These are all things that we've talked about for the most part. Schedule references um, is where sub-productions or other productions are scheduled. Um, and the synchronized reference is basically says if I'm running this particular, this particular production order, and let's say I have sub-orders against that, it will schedule those as well. But if I synchronize them, then it's basically if you think about I've got component um, A that needs to be in the finished goods production order, it's going to choose those to know that, well, I need to schedule and I need to deliver component A before I can deliver that component into um, my finished good production order from a, from a final assembly, let's say. So it actually allows it for the, the system to adjust and change the date for the subcomponents as well as the finished good um, component all at the same time. The, the outcome from operation scheduling is that the dates are displayed so it will actually show you on the production order, let's say, that, that a, um, a production order has been scheduled and what the, the um, end date is going to be. Um, a reservation is automatically generated for the necessary work center. That should obviously be resource or resource group. Um, so that's where you can actually look at the capacity that's reserved for that particular resource. And the status of the production has changed to schedule. So it typically goes from created to estimated to schedule. And for those of you who may not know, if you go to schedule, the system will automatically run the estimation process. So typically when you jump a stage, um, the system doesn't ignore it. It will go back and perform that the, the requirements of that particular stage, but it allow it gives you more flexibility in well, I don't need to go from created to estimated to scheduled. I'm just going to go to schedule. The system will still perform the function um, of the estimated stage. Job scheduling, the, the form is pretty much the same. Again, I can look at specific times. I can look at um, a new resource that I want to schedule from, from a job scheduling standpoint. Now, if you remember the difference between operation scheduling and job scheduling. Operation is more long term and it is based on date. So it's basically saying today I have eight hours of capacity and today I'm scheduled, I'm reserving eight hours of capacity. Um, versus job scheduling, more short term um, and it does require date and time. So if I know that I want to schedule based on a particular time, I can see that in here as well. Um, scheduling limitations. Finite capacity, finite material, finite property. Um, the ones I geared in on here were keeping the production unit. Um, you can have production units set up for grouping of resources, and you can have those particular uh, resources um, kept within those particular production units. And you can also keep the, the warehouse from a resource. Um, so if you've got a particular input warehouse, you can make sure that the resources that are available for that particular warehouse, let's say, are used for that particular job. And it's not going to look at, you know, a bigger pool that could limit your, your pool of resources. Now, master planning is the engine that 
that calculates what you need to produce, when you need to produce it, and how much. Um, and the net requirements of what is needed in a production order. And again, this is typically run in an overnight batch job. So if we just look at 12 here real quick, there is actually a master planning module. You can set up these plans to be run. Um, this is actually setting up the actual plan itself. Um, in the periodic, this is where you can actually run your master schedule. So you tell it what plan you want to run. If you want to do a particular batch, you want to do it as a batch job, you would just go in here and set up it and tell it what time you want to do it, um, how, how often reoccurring you want that particular job to run. Um, typically, if you are also using forecast scheduling, this is basically using maybe sales forecast or purchasing forecast. You typically run the forecast schedule first, and then you run the master plan. Because what you need is the forecast schedule to be created in order for the master plan to see the forecast that also need to be scheduled again. So getting into um, specifically production order planning, we've kind of gone through the requirements, um, the setup, the resources, the calendars, um, the different types of scheduling levels. It needs to be considered when you're setting up how you how you want to schedule your resources and schedule your jobs. Remember, everything goes back to this is my particular production order. These are my resources that I need to, to fulfill that or the material that I need to fulfill that. It will look at all of your available resources and it will come back with a suggested delivery date for that particular production order. But you can change it. Um, you know, you can bump it out. With it's fairly, you know, logical if you, if you go, well, I really don't need it until next day, so I'm going to push it out. Um, but again, that depends on your scheduling direction when you schedule your resources. Or, you know, if you need it sooner, then you have to figure out where your resources are going to come from in order to meet that delivery date for that particular order. So once master planning runs, it will create planned production orders that then you can actually run a scheduling against to see what your available resources are for that particular job. So if we go back into production, production control, and we look at our planned orders, I don't think I have any. Okay, I have one planned production order with a delivery date of 1-30-2012. Now, if you remember when you're setting up your bill of material and you've got your, um, your, your route set up with your particular operation that needs to be done, you can actually see this from the actual plan production order. only 
one resource, it's not the whole group. If I was doing the group, then I could spread it out across multiple resources in the group, or just do it based on each one. Um, this job has actually been scheduled to a start of uh, T10. Now, if I go into my capacity reservation, it's going to point me to this particular um, resource, 00101, and it's going to tell me where my capacity is. And it's based on production order, and you can see I have 442 hours because, again, this resource has 100% efficiency percentage, and I'm scheduling a total of 10 hours across this particular job. If I'm in a particular production order and I want to reschedule it, I can just go into the scheduling tab on the production order, schedule the operation, um, tell it what scheduling direction I want to use. So let's say I want to do it from the scheduling date and I'm using my, um, let's move into this year. Let's say I'm going to schedule it to 424. So if I run that schedule, now if I go back into that particular resource, Um, I can actually click on the view and go into my capacity reservation. And as you can see now, it's telling me, well, my date is now 12.4, and I'm going to do it. Remember, I did forward from the scheduling date. So my scheduling date was um, 2.24. So it's basically saying I have eight hours of capacity on the 24th, and I'll finish it up on the 27th. Um, one other thing talking about, going back to the whole master planning and the scheduling of uh, creating the plan production orders, um, from a net requirement standpoint, I can look at what is driving this particular sales order, this particular production order. So I actually have a sales order with a requirement date of 2-6 um, with a requirement date of 27 on my production order. So if I look at my messages, um, not turned on at the moment, but if I look at my messages, it should tell me to either bump this sales order out because I can't deliver it in time, or adjust my, look at my capacity, look at my availability, and adjust this um, production order back to um, where I can actually meet the delivery date. But if I look at this, I can probably, um, if I want to reschedule this capacity, um, Let's say backwards from delivery date. That shouldn't matter because it's that based on the delivery date. Then you can look at your resource and see that it should be telling you now that I'm going to deliver that. I need that resource available um, based on my delivery date. So it's adjusting based on what I think it should be doing. A lot of this is um, getting your getting your parameters set up, getting your resources set up with the correct hours, and then determining what your best um, scheduling direction is going to be. Um, you can, like I, I said earlier, you can go into periodic and you, run, you can run the job scheduling. You can go into production order planning, which remember these are the planned production orders that are recommended from master planning. And you can select work orders. You can see here these are planned production orders that have been selected that I can then go ahead and run scheduling against those particular orders. So the nice thing about master planning and planned orders is you don't have to, you can take bits and pieces of the pie out without taking the whole pie, you know, without scheduling the whole pie. So it allows you to look at particular delivery dates and go ahead and schedule those dates and then see where you have issues with your capacity. Um, one of the functionalities that, that, are, that is available is allows you to lock production orders. And this says exactly what it says. You can actually go in, and again, you can, if you notice on the previous screen, on the previous slide, there is the ability here to, um, to mark and lock. Uh, this is actually the plan screen. But you can actually mark and lock um, a batch of production orders at once. So you don't have to go into every single one. But locking basically is just lock it for scheduling. I've scheduled this particular production order. I don't want it to change, so I want to lock this in. Um, and it's useful in short scheduling and where you don't want the schedule to be changed. Um, and it's very easy 
on the actual production order on the setup staff tab. This is where it will actually flip that production order to being locked or not. And if you get one and go, oh, well, this one's giving me some more flexibility, so I'm going to go in and unlock it. You can just go in and flip the switch on that particular production order. And this is just on the production order itself. If you go into the scheduling tab, again, you can select multiple production orders to lock once it's scheduled. Uh, dispatching, this gives you the availability to view um, your resources. You'll notice that this is actually coming from the resource itself. And if you go into dispatching, it will actually show you what production orders these particular jobs are, this particular resource is dispatched to. And you can look at it also from, from the Gantt chart view. Um, and it's just this particular one, there's a, a resource view and there's a, I believe it's called an object view or um, a job view. So this one is actually allowing me to look at it from, these are my individual production orders, this is my individual resource, and this is what's scheduled for that particular resource. Uh, subcontracting, um, you can obviously schedule your subcontracting within the bill of material too. And on the route, you just need to specify that it is a vendor line type. And also on the route, on the operation of the route, make a note that it's actually a vendor as well. And then that will help drive and manage the planning if there's any requirement for a purchase order to that vendor. Then you can generate the purchase order for that particular, um, for whatever the, the requirement is from that particular vendor. But it also gives you, your, if you recall back in the, um, the resource, I could specify a vendor as a resource. So I could, from an internal standpoint, manage how much capacity, based on what that vendor told me he has, how much capacity I actually have available for that particular vendor. And that's based on what capacity he's telling you he has for you, um, not what you think he should potentially have for you. So. The subcontracting can also be scheduled on the production order uh, based on, again, whatever viable information you have from your vendor that you can use to schedule your job again. There are some optional settings. Um, again, I said earlier that operations and routes are optional. You don't have to have them on a production order. It's kind of weird not to do that, though. Uh, but there's also production groups and production pools that you can that you can use. Production groups will help drive reporting, um, and if you have a ledger posting on the group, then it will apply to any um, subsequent ties to that particular group. And the production pools are really a grouping mechanism as well. Um, on the parameters, um, when you get into the route, um, you can actually have cost categories associated the cost category is where you can apply the hourly rate to that particular cost so that when you're estimating the production order or you're even doing a bomb calculation, it knows based on the cost category that you're using what the rate is that should be applied to that particular cost category. So if it's $10 an hour, that's where it's going to, to post. When you're doing project forecasting, when you put a cost category on there, that's where it estimates the dollars associated, again, with the, the budget for that particular project. So it, it basically does the same thing, establishes the cost. It can then be applied to the um, estimate of a production order or applied to, applied to the forecast slash budget of a project. Um, and this just basically allows you to set up shared categories, which is new in 2012, and it tells you whether these categories can be used across projects, on expenses, or in production. Um, cost group. This is where you can set up um, for additional um, analyzing cost contributions. So if you had, um, you know, factory burden or overhead that you wanted to apply, then you could apply this cost group. Um, and then that would, that would uh, apply whatever the additional percentage might be for that particular um, additional cost contribution. And then it's associated back to the cost category. Um, now the route, the route group, 
Um, you can specify whether you want to include it in the costing or the estimate. And you basically are going to set it up based on actually these different switches here as to what's available um, for that particular route group. Whether you want calculations, planning, or feedback, you'll notice in this little box that there's a setup. And you basically go through here and define based on if I'm doing the queue before, if I'm doing setup, do I want to activate it, which means do I want to include this in calculations, planning, or feedback. Um, a primary one for us in scheduling is going to be job requirement working time. Um, do I want my job scheduled by the system and at what point, at what, um, at what operation, if I'm doing setup, if I'm doing runtime, what, do I want to include my setup in my scheduling or not? And that would be based on whether I have the switch set. The working time, um, if it's on, it's going to use whatever the working calendar is for that particular resource. Um, and if it's not, it's just going to use a 24-hour calendar if that switch is turned off. Uh, the capacity switch just basically determines whether or not um, you're going to run that particular, whether or not that capacity is going to be reserved. Again, if I'm not reserving a setup, then that switch would be turned on. Um, prioritizing, we talked about a little bit about being able to set up routes. Um, you've got different ones that you can set up. It can be just a simple network. It can be more complex where you've got two things running in parallel together. And this is where you can actually go into the setup of the bill of material and you can schedule a property for this. And then when you actually do the operation scheduling, there's a function that allows you to sort it. And based on the priority of the, of the way the uh, bill of material and the route is set up, you can determine what your sorting is going to be. Priority based on delivery date. Um, there's some other ones here, status scheduled. Um, so this, this allows you to sort it basically is going to look at your production order, sort them in a particular way if they're set up as a priority um, for that bill of material and that route. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's going to schedule according to that sorting um, that you have set up. Uh, splitting, you can split production orders up until the time that they are um, scheduled, up until the total quantity of the production order is scheduled. So if you've got a customer that says, well, I need 10 right away, you can split it and then reschedule the two production orders so that you get actual, you can get better delivery dates and capacity reservations based on the fact that that, um, that that production order has now been split into two. These are just some considerations when you're splitting. They have the specific status that it needs to be in, um, what happens. Uh, one of the other things I just wanted to cover real quickly is just um, your brief expo exposure to scheduling and projects. Scheduling and projects will use the same resources as long as, if you recall earlier, there was a, there was a capacity on the production setup that allowed you to schedule capacity based on planned orders or based on projects. So if you want to schedule your capacity along with production from a project standpoint, then you would flip that switch on um, on the on the parameters so that it also looks at the resources in the project. Again, projects are typically done um, where you've got a quotation that's got a forecast slash budget against it, and that can be pushed across to the project when the quotation is confirmed. And then you can then go in and start assigning resources to the different forecast areas so that you're reserving your capacity, your available resources based on what's required for that particular project. So it's a different, um, it's a different approach, it's a different aspect of AX, of AX. it's been there for a while, um, but it allows you to use the same resources across both projects and um, a production order. You may have a case where you've got a client that, you know, maybe doesn't doesn't care about the detail of a particular component, and he's just going to let that um, be built against a sub-project. So we don't have a production order to schedule the capacity, but I may be using the same resource that is going to be good. Uh, maybe a standard product is being um, produced from a production order. So you want to schedule that resource across both, um, across both production and project, so it allows you to 
to do that. It allows you to look at your available capacity, whether it's from a project or a production order, and, and allows you to, um, to reserve the capacity that's actually available. Um, this is just a quick slide on what it looks like from a, from a project scheduling standpoint. I have a forecast set up here for 24 hours. And I have a worker, this is my resource, this associated 101. And then you can see down here that I've actually taken those 24 hours. He has 100% um, efficiency percentage. So it's just basically scheduled eight hours across um, for each of those particular um, projects, for each of those particular um, days required for that capacity. Um, that's about all I have. Um, again, it's just it's a compilation of the setup. Um, whether you want to run operation scheduling, job scheduling, um, creating the resource, your resource group. If you want to go down to the level of capacity, um, capabilities, and skills that someone may need, that's identified on a particular route step um, to be able to pull and, and reserve that particular capacity capability. Um, you know, running the job or operation scheduling engine, and then running master planning also, and using all of those tools together to determine, um, you know, what my best delivery date can be based on what my capacity availability is. Um, and again, it goes back from, it, it encompasses both production and the project uh, management and accounting module to be able to reserve capacity um, the same resource capacity across both when you're trying to schedule and determine what my best delivery date can be. All right, that's what all I have. I, okay, then um, if you do, if, if anything comes across your mind that you want to um, ask about, just the email address is on the screen. It's info at ibisinc.com, and we'll get back to you um, with the answer. Thank you, and um, have a good rest of your day. Bye.